Well, it's Monday, the 19th day of August 2013. Good evening and welcome to Kitchen Prime. My name is James Smart. And I'm Betty Kello. Let's begin by taking a look at our top stories tonight. Five of the nine commissioners voted in favor of asking the Chief Registrar of Judiciary to take compulsory relief during the 15 days when the investigations will be in process. There is no financial impropriety or irregularities in the procurement processes of the judiciary. Villain of victim Gladys Relay is sent on compulsory leave. A new pay plot. YMPs may soon set their own salaries. Also coming up, who planted the two bombs in Huruma Estate? And just what is in a box Kenyatta's safe that has never been opened? Good evening and welcome to your most authoritative bulletin. We begin at the judiciary where Chief Registrar Gladys Relay has been sent on compulsory leave pending investigation into claims of financial impropriety. The Judicial Service Commission voted 5 to 4 to suspend Shelley on forced leave and appointed two committees to look into the allegations facing her. Well, but Shelley has stamped the decision as unfortunate and irregular. But as Rita Tina reports, the JSC did not disclose what exactly the allegations against Shelley are. After a weekend meeting of the Judicial Service Commission in Mombasa, the resolve to send the Chief Registrar of the Judiciary Gladys Shuley on compulsory leave over allegations of financial impropriety, the JSC met again at the Supreme Court. The meeting presided over by the JSC Chairperson Chief Justice Willie Mutunga lasted for over three hours and upheld the decision taken over the weekend. Five of the nine commissioners voted in favor of asking the Chief Registrar of Judiciary to take compulsory relief during the 15 days when the investigations will be in process. Four commissioners voted against this decision. Two committees of the JSC have been formed to look into allegations against Gladys Shelley. The JSC, however, did not elaborate what the allegations involve, only indicating that the committee will inquire into the process of procurement, employment, administration, finance, and corporate governance of the judiciary. It will be conducted with fairness, transparency. But moments later, Gladys Shelley shot back, terming the decision as unfortunate and irregular. I have been true and faithful to the transformation agenda of the judiciary and more importantly to my values and integrity. There is no financial impropriety or irregularities in the procurement processes of the judiciary. She says she still remains in the dark over the allegations against her. I can confirm to you that I have not been provided with any particulars forming the basis of the decision. Neither did the JSC give reasons for arriving at their decision. She questions the basis of the decision to send her on compulsory leave. There is no statutory or regulatory provision for sending the chief registrar on compulsory leave. Gladys Shele, however, welcomes the probe and wants the net cast wider. In addition to the JSC probe, I call upon the Auditor General, the Public Procurement Oversight Authority, and all other relevant government agencies, including relevant parliamentary committees, to carry out a comprehensive assessment and audit of the financial management, procurement, and human resource management of the judiciary. The two committees formed to inquire into the allegations have 15 days to conclude their work. The Finance and Administration Committee will be chaired by Ahmed Nasir Abdullahi and will have six members. The Human Resource Management Committee, on the other hand, will be chaired by Justice Isaac Lenaola and will have six members as well, with some members sitting in both committees. Rita Tinina, KTN.
Now, the allegations against the chief registrar have reignited debate on the thorny issue of judicial reforms. Shale had embarked on a raft of reforms that are now at the center of this latest saga. So is she a villain of graft or a victim of powerful cartels in the judiciary? KTN's Ashimulu takes a closer look. You you Just two weeks ago, Gladys Boss Cholet and the Chief Justice made an impromptu tour of the Milimani Law Courts and made this promise. What we have done is gone there to improve. We are engineering the process of the registry. Minutes earlier, she had taken the Chief Justice Willy Mutunga through the ongoing reform projects at the courts. The same projects that have now landed her in hot soup. I have built my reputation over the years as an honest and hard-working woman in the public service. This was until the JSC made the unfortunate, irregular, and procedural and irresponsible decision. As Chief Registrar of the Judiciary, Cholet <laughs> runs a powerhouse that puts her at the epitome of all operations in the third arm of the government. The Chief Registrar's role is more or less um, a one-man's job to do almost everything in the judiciary either finances, human resource, uh, management itself, administration itself, even in terms of transferring for personnel, including judges from one station to another. The powerful role of the chief registrar's office means that with all projects and operations of the judiciary, the buck ultimately ought to stop with Gladys Boss Cholet. Ultimately, all these persons uh, report to the chief registrar. Nothing is done by these people without the involvement and without the consent and concurrence of the chief registrar. That is why eventually it is our who is responsible. Cholet has been at the forefront of attempting to complete the task of reforming the judiciary, a job that began with a so-called radical surgery in 2003 but never made much headway. Judiciary analysts say that during her tenure, Shalei has spearheaded the decentralization of the Court of Appeal aimed at confronting the backlog of cases at the country's second highest court. This, according to insiders, has eliminated huge allowances appellate judges would claim while on duty outside Nairobi. She has also bought buildings to be occupied by the Judicial Service Commission, Judiciary Staff and the Court of Appeal. Cholet further introduced an efficiency management system to improve the organization of case files. But now, some of legal experts argue that she may be a victim of corrupt cartels in the judiciary. She has done everything within her ability to ensure that there is greater transparency, the networks of corruption in, in, on matters related to procurement, uh, in, in the judiciary had dealt with. A possibility she alluded to two weeks ago. You know, whenever there's chaos, there are those people who benefit from the chaos. So they will be unhappy, of course, if you try and streamline the chaos. But there are those who've been suffering on account of those chaos who are very happy. As the probe into Cholet's conduct begins, the intrigues of the judiciary will be followed closely, especially coming at a time when the succession of Dr. Willy Mutunga as Chief Justice is well underway. And in the next two weeks, it will become clear whether one of Kenya's most powerful women in the legal fraternity is a villain of corruption <laughs> or a victim of malice. Asham Wilu, KTN, Nairobi. Well, and I'm joined by Charles Kanjama, who is a lawyer and also council member of the Law Society of Kenya. Charles, thank you very much for making time to speak with me this evening. Uh, we don't have so much details, Charles, about these happenings, but... Uh, why I'm interested to talk to you tonight is just to talk to me about the rule of natural justice, Charles. As compared to what we know now, how, what, what's your comment about that? Uh, first of all, uh, James, maybe I could begin by explaining what the Constitution requires in a situation of this nature. First of all, you have Article 47 of the Constitution, which requires that any administrative action of this nature must be fair. It must be efficient, it must be procedurally f uh, fair and reasonable. In addition, there is a requirement under Article 236 of the Constitution that whenever you want to subject a public officer to any disciplinary action, 
you shall follow due process of law. You shall not victimize them. You shall not subject them to, uh, to that disciplinary action without due process of law. And uh, of course, the question is, has what has taken place complied with the Constitution? Because even this uh, compulsory suspension is a disciplinary process. And what uh, the Chief Registrar of the Judiciary has said, James, is that under the Judicial Service Act, there are a number of uh, remedies that can be taken for an officer who has misconducted or who is suspected of misconducting themselves. This include uh, suspension and interdiction and even reprimand. But nowhere in the law is there a procedure for compulsory relief. So these are some of the concerns that uh, have been raised and I think uh, we as Kenyans and we as uh, members of the legal profession in particular will be keenly watching to see uh, is a Judicial Service Commission, which should be really the exemplar of fairness and justice, are they practicing it, in this case involving the Chief Register of the Judiciary? So, so Charles, having pointed that out um, in terms of the law and what is provided for in the law, the JSE uh, claims that there are uh, financial impropriety that are involved you know, in this particular matter. Are we saying that this process, in the end, can be challenged in a court of law? And what are the rights of the Chief Registrar as at this point? Of course it can be challenged in a court of law, James. I think uh, the real concern we have is that the allegations by themselves having been made in public already uh, damaging the reputation and character of a state or a public officer. They are very serious allegations and my expectation would have been that allegations of such nature would not be made in public without having afforded the chief registrar of the judiciary an opportunity really uh, to respond to the issue. So I find it to be uh, really surprising that uh, she would come out and say she doesn't know anything about the probe that has been begun. Uh, but having said that, uh, we have to wait and see what are the substantive merits or demerits of the claims and allegations against her. Uh, definitely the Judicial Service Commission has a mandate, uh, a very strong responsibility to ensure integrity in all its officers and they must act uh, very promptly when uh, they have any suspicion of impropriety. Yet I wonder whether the approach they have followed of publicly uh, sending an officer on compulsory leave without having given them notification is the right way to go. Uh, interestingly, James, uh, the Chief Justice noted that even that decision was a split decision, 5-4, which is showing that there's a lot of division in the uh, Judicial Service Commission. Kenyans are watching because this is a big test for the judiciary. If they fail this, uh, this test is going to be uh, a big disappointment to all of us Kenyans who are hoping that the reforms in the judiciary really have settled. Well, Charles, uh, to, to a judiciary that uh, has been trying to claw back or trying to explain itself after that Supreme Court ruling that uh, just a few months ago, uh, as a member of the, you know, the LSK and you know, the judiciary in a, in a sense, uh, do you think this happenings today uh, will help the judiciary in terms of you know, getting better you know, and trying to say, listen, we're opening up and, you know, we're over all these reforms that are coming up. And how will the public react to this institution that now uh, is at the center of, you know, these claims? Uh, James, I cannot talk for the Law Society of Kenya. I'm just one member of the Law Society. I can talk for myself and as a person who's uh, keenly interested in reforms as an advocate and as one of the members of the Law Society of Kenya. I think uh, what has happened today is, even without knowing whether there is a substance to the allegations, it is a bit disappointing. Uh, I think they would have uh, used a different approach in addressing disciplinary issues. Keep in mind, James, that all Kenyans who have problems of disciplinary nature in their places of work, they go to the judiciary to seek recourse. And the Judicial Service Commission is really the senior most board in the judiciary. Of course, you can challenge a decision of the Judicial Service Commission in court, but the Judicial Service Commission has to consider themselves like Caesar's wife. They have to be above reproach. Everything they do uh, cannot have uh, even the whisper of uh, lack of due process. And I think what we have seen so far is uh, leaving uh, many serious questions in the, the minds uh, of Kenyans about is this the right way to go about this process. Definitely they have to fight corruption, but as, as your story has put it, is uh, Gladys Sholei the victim, the villain, 
what are the what are the facts that is what we want to know so I tell one final question Charles uh, just uh, the last few months we've seen uh, people in public office the NSF boss uh, who was let go out of uh, what it was called gross misconduct we've seen the cabs uh, MD then also uh, fired out of what they called also gross misconduct and we've seen claims even against minister for mining that is on Obraji Balala on bribery allegations. Uh, we don't seem to have a way of how to deal with issues of integrity and corruption, Charles, as a country, do we? Uh, we do have a way. The Public Officer Ethics Act has a system. The different uh, laws in this country and the Constitution have an approach. We cannot adopt a, a very soft approach which allows uh, corrupt officers to remain in office and continue uh, engaging in corruption as investigations are going on. Neither can we adopt an approach which is so hard and at the merest whisper of an allegation, you terminate those officers. And the Constitution requires due process, Article 47, requires fair administrative action. In the case of public officers, there's a requirement. That requirement involves a number of particulars. One, you have to inform. There's a duty to inform the officer involved. Uh, the principles of natural justice, they, they have a right to be heard before adverse disciplinary decisions are made against them. And then no one should be a judge in their own cause. Really, the person who's complaining against a particular officer should not be the one who uh, constitutes the tribunal to hear the allegation. These are basic principles of natural justice. Someone is entitled to reasons, entitled to adequate time to prepare their response or their defense. There are a number of criteria that uh, day in, day out in the employment courts, the industrial courts in Kenya, lawyers are arguing cases of employees who've been wrongly dismissed. And the members of the Judicial Service Commission, of course, know about all these requirements. Charles. Kanjama, LSK Council member and a lawyer. Thank you very much for making time to speak with us. Always a pleasure picking your brains. All right. Now, here now is a look at Gladys Shelley's journey to where she is today. Gladys Shelley holds a Master's of Law degree from University of Cape Town, specializing in maritime environment law. She also holds a Master of Business Administration on degree from Jomo Kenyatta University, a Bachelor's of Law degree from University of Nairobi, and a Diploma in Law from Kenya School of Law. Now she joined the University United Nations Environment Program as an international waters consultant and taught the law of the sea at the University of Nairobi. She then became the assistant editor at the National Council for Law Reporting, where five years later she was appointed as CEO. In 2009, Shulei was installed as the deputy chief electoral officer for the interim independent electoral committee, a position that sprang her career in the judiciary. She was then appointed as an advocate in the judiciary, a position she held for 15 years. It was in 2011 that Gladys Shelley was appointed as chief registrar in the judiciary. All right, now to other stories of the day. And now to the arm of the government, that's parliament, where a new plot by MPs is in the offing to give themselves powers to set their own salaries. A new bill has been published seeking to free MPs' salaries from the control of the Salaries and Remuneration Commission. Erno Cheng reports on the latest move that has baffled many observers. One bill set to be introduced in both the Senate and the National Assembly when Parliament reconvenes early next month will surely draw the attention of the public. This is the Constitutional of Kenya Amendment Bill 2013 that seeks to free MPs from constitutional provisions on state officers, including salaries. The amendment is expected to receive overwhelming support from MPs who have spiritedly fought the Salaries and Remuneration Commission's attempt to restructure their pay package. The current structure, the current parliament and the state officers that we are dealing with as SRC are new state officers under the new constitution. We went out to set salaries for those new state officers. MPs in the Justice and Legal Affairs Committee drafted the bill, with the architect being the Ruaraka Member of Parliament, T.J. Kajuang. The bill proposes to amend Article 260 of the Constitution to remove all members of the Senate and National Assembly, members of the county assemblies, judges and magistrates from the list of designated state officers.
The amendment must be passed in both houses by at least two-thirds of all members in the second and third readings. The amendment will leave MPs in the jurisdiction of the Parliamentary Service Commission, as was the case before, while the judges and magistrates will be under the Judicial Service Commission. The Parliamentary Service Commission is a responsible commission, constitutionally uh, created. Um, we also know that the other commissions also uh, popularly known as the Chapter 15 commissions. We will therefore, uh, obviously, as we'll be expectant, be engaging with uh, all, all those other bodies and other arms of government. And therefore, we are not limited to only dealing with the SRC. The amendment will have more far-reaching implications other than the salary issue since it deals with the definition of a state officer. The Constitution stipulates in Chapter 6 the conduct of state officers and restrictions on their activities which may result in their dismissal or removal from office, including integrity of the officer. The Constitution further restricts state officers from holding office in a political party. Should the bill sail through and is signed into law, it will be one of the many pieces of legislation that the 11th Parliament has passed, so far, most of it being to serve their own interests. I think the bill for the MPs wanting to remove themselves from the uh, SRC is, uh, to me, is, is greed now. Because basically what they are telling us as Kenyans, uh, you cannot stop us from earning what you want to earn. Parliamentary convinced on 3rd September. Aaron Ocheng, KTN. The PQ, in association with Nguvu Cement. And that story on the MP's new plot to set their own salaries leads us to a big question tonight. And we ask, are you satisfied with the performance of the 11th Parliament so far? Are you satisfied with the performance of the 11th Parliament so far? Send your yes or no response with a brief comment to the number 8040 and Smart and I will sample them during this newscast. Choose Nguvu for undoubted strength. Now there was panic at Nairobi's Hurume estate after two old bombs were recovered in a sewer this morning. The bombs were discovered by a woman who was cleaning a sewer. It was a call to residents of these flats in Uruma estate to vacate their houses immediately. Police had a difficult time trying to clear the residents from the busy area in fear of a tragedy. Residents of Uruma trying to have a glimpse of two old bombs discovered in a sewer in the area. <laughs> The two old bombs were recovered from a trench near soldiers of faith church causing panic in the area. Though police confirmed the bombs are old, they can cause harm and even death if detonated. And indeed when we arrived at the scene we found that it was a bomb looking device big enough to flatten a big area. Going by the look of the, uh, the, the physical car, it has been maybe used in the first or second world war but it is still alive however there are concerns about how officers from the bomb disposal unit handle the five kilogram devices the police warned of how dangerous the devices could be they remained in the vicinity for an extended period with the potentially deadly devices just close by it did not help matters that the police decided to transport the bombs in their vehicle. They claimed the devices were too big and it would thus be risky to detonate them on the ground. Police are investigating the source and motive behind these devices. Angel Katusa, KTM Prime.
Now, the strength of the Jubilee Coalition after the March 4th general election will come to test tomorrow as the ruling coalition's parliamentary group meeting is set to meet to discuss the referendum agenda. Well, Deputy President William Ruto, who will chair the meeting, is expected to convince the senators and members of the National Assembly allied to the coalition to resist attempts by the Code Coalition and a number of governors from Jubilee, led by Bomet Governor Isaac Ruto, to push for a constitutional referendum. Already, the Bomet Governor, a close ally of, de of the Deputy President, has publicly differed with his party over the referendum, saying he is not afraid of being suspended from the URP party. Well, the ruling coalition is being accused of frustrating devolution by holding funds meant to be sent to the counties. Indeed, also the Orange Democratic Movement will tomorrow hold the National Executive Council meeting being led by former Prime Minister Raila Odinga. The BQ, in association with Nguvu Cement. Well, it's time to take a short commercial break, but before then, let's review our BQ tonight. And we had asked, are you satisfied with the performance of the 11th Parliament so far? Are you satisfied with the performance of the 11th Parliament so far? Indeed, you can send us your yes or no responses to the number 8040 or tweeters at Katie and Kenya or at Betty Kello or at James Smart. And Betty and I will sample your views during this live news because the number is 8040. Choose Nguvu for undoubted strength. Time for that break, but don't go away. More to come just ahead. All right, what is in this box? Kenya's TTS safe that has never been opened. Now in 1946, Mzee Jomo Kenyatta lived in a house next to the then Kenya Teachers College in Gidonguri. The man who would later become Kenya's first president bought a heavy metallic safe in which he stored vital documents. And tonight, Wilkie Senyabwa tells us that story of a house and a safe that got secrets from Kenya's past. The old and the new find a meeting place here, in a house that has stood for over six decades. It sits silently, an ordinary looking house behind the Gidonguri district headquarters, holding on to extraordinary secrets. This was first president Mze Jomo Kenyatta's home for years, before he was arrested and taken to Kapenguria. Kenyatta returned to the country in 1946, after 18 years abroad. He reunited with an old friend, Ronald Ngala, and agreed to teach at the Kenya Teachers College in Gidonguri. With a new job in place, he needed a home within walking distance. And when the house was complete, Jomo became the first occupant of the house next to Ronald Ngala's. The new house served as a meeting place for local and regional leaders fighting against colonial rule. Africa siku hiyo ilikuwa kuna nchi ya Afrika ilikuwa na uhuru. Walikuwa na walikuwa na jadiliana hapa kutoka viongozi kutoka uh, Afrika nzima. Sensitive documents and money were often entrusted to Kenyatta for safekeeping. It was only logical that shortly after he arrived, Kenyatta procured a metallic safe. So heavy was it, it is reported that 30 men were required to carry the safe into the house, but only Kenyatta had a key. 
wakati huo pesa zilikuwa na jengwa kwa zilikuwa na rokotu wa kila mahali katika Kenya uh, na age group hapa iko marika ya miaka na miaka miaka kama tatu hivi nafanya rika moja alafu nafanywa kiongozi mmoja kutoka area kama hii ya Kiambu ya kurokota pesa mahali pesa zitapelekwa za kujenga shule na za kuokoa nchi yetu kwa hivyo siku hiyo hakuna bengi Activities at the house came to an abrupt halt in 1952. At the height of the liberation struggle, Jomo Kenyatta was arrested together with five others and sentenced to prison in Kapenguria. He would remain behind bars until 1961, even after he was released and went on to become Kenya's first president, never again would Kenyatta set foot in the house. Nobody could find the key to the safe, and it is reported that it has never been opened since. Kama aliwacha ili ilitolewa na wazungu wale wale mulipo eh, kwa sababu walikaa kwa miaka mingi na tena ndani ya nyumba. Mtu anaweza kujua tu ni 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 ile kitu tu tunaweza kusema tu na tunataka ije hapa ni zile guo alikuwa anavaa kwa sababu alikuwa anavaa majacket ile ya ya ngozi na makofia ile mkubwa ile ya skauti alikuwa anavaa hizo but the house found new occupants. It was the property of the provincial administration and housed various officials. The current occupant is a veterinary officer. She and her family have made a cozy home here. But the history of the house has not been completely forgotten. The National Museums of Kenya has gazetted the house. It has, however, never moved or opened the safe. Among those who know the story, it is rumored that Kenyatta's locked safe may contain vital documents, such as original maps that mark out Kenya's boundaries. Others, however, believe that all valuable documents were taken out long before Kenyatta was arrested, leaving behind only items of sentimental value. Wakati alijua atashikwa, ile mambo muhimu yote alitua. Na waka hatujua alipeleka watu. Mahali alifika. Zile zitu naweza patikana huko tutu ni mambo tu ya shule, document ya shule wakati likuwa na endetu. Na kama sasa hiyo hali ya watu ya Afrika, naweza patikana huko. Kwa sababu wakati alishikwa, 1952 mwezi wa kumi, haku hudi hapa. 67 years after the safe was carried in, it sits silently in the house in which Kenyatta once lived, the silent witness to the country's history, jealously holding on to its secrets. Wilkis Anyapwa for the 50-year series. Smart as I was actually hoping that Wilkista finally opened the yeah. safe actually, she's after all those she's, years. She's done a disservice to us. So <laughs> we, we need to open that safe <laughs> and you know remove the secrets of the last 50 years. Exactly. Like. <laughs> Wilkista, that's a, another idea for Kenya at the 50 series. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. In China, the head of the first arm of government, President Huru Kenyatta, oversaw the signing of agreements worth 425 billion shillings with the Eastern Giant. Well, the bulk of the funds will go towards what officials call economic partnerships, as well as wildlife protection and a standard coach railway. Katyn's Ben Kitili takes a look at the significant development that may be a sign of things to come. Perhaps to signal China's place in Kenya's economic development blueprint, this has been President Uhuru Kenyatta's first state visit outside Africa. And the Chinese did not disappoint. According to President Kenyatta, a 21-gun salute at the Great Hall of People, the most iconic building in China. And in what could be the start of a new chapter in Kenya's trade relations, President Kenyatta secured agreements worth 425 billion shillings. It's a, it's a major statement. It's as big a statement as when the Chinese congratulated the president first, if you remember, when he won the election before everybody else. That was a powerful message. We need capital. Uh, uh, we need money. China's got a lot of it. 340 billion of this amount will go towards the standard gauge railway that is set to link the port of Mombasa and the border town of Malaba, as well as take care of economic partnerships and wildlife protection. But this Chinese president, Xi Jinping, said is just the beginning of a fruitful partnership between the two countries. 
he promised to explore other areas of investment, singling out agribusiness, irrigation, fertilizer production and purchases, as well as technology. However, prior to this, trade between Kenya and China has been minimal. So what could be changing? Economist Alikan Sachu points to a number of attractive economic prospects in Kenya and Kenya's obvious need for financial investment. We are a transit state. Uh, uh, we are the route to the sea for this huge East African community. And uh, well, in order to maintain that position, we've got to leapfrog our infrastructure. And China is like a banker. It's like going to the bank. However, the ties are not limited to economic development. President Kenyatta and his Chinese counterpart have also promised to increase contact between Kenya's ruling Jubilee Coalition and China's ruling party, the Communist Party of China. Uh, the president is making a serious statement that, you know, he's rebalancing towards the east. I'm sure Washington is watching. President Kenyatta's China tour is expected to graduate the bilateral ties between the two countries into a special partnership, perhaps a tilt towards the east by the Jubilee administration. Ben Kitili, KTN. Time for business. Parastatals have over the years been known as money guzzlers for the government with billions sunk into them with little or no returns. But with the, with the cash strapped government realign, realignment rather to state corporations is required and has so far seen a number of heads roll. Michael Karanja has these details. With the government keen to streamline its operations and cut down bloated costs, state farms and corporations have come into sharp focus recently, costing the government upwards of 400 billion shillings annually and nothing much to show for it, parastatals are poised for major restructuring. The government can ill afford the luxury of running the quasi-government institutions that have for many years been used as cash cows. In June, the president formed a 10-member team to review parastatal policies, charged with identifying challenges and propose a new policy direction for state farms. Collapsing, merging and scrapping parastatals is one avenue the government is looking at to benefit from the billions sunk into them. In the ICT sector, three bodies, the ICT board, e-government and the government information services have been merged from the ICT authority to govern the activities of the new digital government. According to the Mohammed Abdi Kadir led team, the plan is to cut down the number of the money guzzling institutions. The Ministry of Agriculture shall remain with 39 institutions, Education 44, Environment, Water and National Resources 22, Devolution 26 and Industrialization with 20 parastatals. And as the scrutiny into state farms continues, parastatal bosses have not escaped the spotlight. Just last week, Kenya Airports Authority MD Stephen Morioki was sent on terminal leave before his contract, which was up for renewal, had expired. Other bosses that have not escaped the snare include Kenya Pipeline Corporation Celeste Kilinda, NSSF boss Tomo Dongo, KMC Ibrahim Isak, who have been either suspended or fired for various reasons ranging from corruption to nepotism. Realignment and common strategy going forward will be necessary if the government is to benefit from its institutions and turn them into profit-making operations. Michael Karanja, KTN Business Today. Buoyed by growth in revenues, the Standard Group is reporting 109% growth in profit before tax posting 223 million shillings for the half year ended June 31st. During the first six months, revenue grew by 31% to stand at 2.2 billion shillings, up from the 1.7 billion shillings registered last year. This was largely driven by an improvement in the business's value lines. The circulation business grew by 6% during the period, while a print and TV advertising grew by 35 and 92 percent respectively. The Standard Group has been implementing a transformation strategy with a management upbeat that the growth momentum will be carried into the second half, boosting its overall performance. The company says its uh, borrowing costs uh, dropped to 60.5 million shillings uh, from 85.6 million shillings, while earnings per share rose 44 percent to 2.9 shillings. Uh, the board, however, did not declare an interim dividend with the focus being on reinvesting in the company.
Moving on, a fortnight after an early morning inferno gutted down the International Arrivals Unit at the Jomo Kenyatta International Airport, leading to its closure. Operations are said to have resumed, with the airport handling an upwards of 17,000 passengers, stopping its daily passenger numbers. The Principal Secretary for Transport has now confirmed that operations at East Africa's busiest airport are at 100%. Airline operators, business people and regular travelers will be relieved at the news that operations at the Jomo Kenyatta International Airport have resumed to full capacity. And while currently passengers are being cleared using makeshift tents that do not have adequate passenger handling facilities, luggage is also being ferried manually. And passengers are having difficult times locating their belongings. It was, however, interesting to note that National Carrier Kenya Airways managed record numbers of passengers handled at the airport, figures higher than when the airport is operating at optimum. We have already now come back to where we were in terms of passenger numbers. In fact, on Saturday, we carried 11,900. Yesterday, we carried 12,960 passengers, which could be a record for us. So we have, we have recovered. As part of the airport reorganization for operations will be the conversion of the JKIA parking garage into a temporary arrivals hold. Also, the three-story garage that is part of the Terminal 4 will now house airlines, offices, banks, and other facilities that were previously stationed at the arrivals terminal. Officials maintain that this will be a temporary move until the Kenya Airports Authority procures a new ready-made terminal that is expected to be in place in three months, with the opening up of part of Terminal 2 for use by the Kenya Airways for its international departures set to take place this week. Principal Secretary for Transport Ministry in Duva Muli says the airport operations are at 100% and both government and the airport authority were now moving to enhance the quality of services at the airport. This is an indication of the government's frantic efforts to have operations at the continent's fourth busiest airport up to speed. This particular area is going, there are going to be some final approvals before we allow passengers in so that we are totally sure that the environment and the building is safe for use. Officials of the Transport Ministry say the new terminal will have a capacity to handle 2.5 million passengers per year with a lifespan of three years. The airport currently handles 6.5 million passengers per year, a number that has been projected to grow to 17 million by the year 2020, pushing the Green Park Airport expansion project higher on the priority list. Boni Tunya, KTN Business. Finally, let's have a look at the financial markets. We bring you sports news. Uh, do stay with us. That in fact, since I took office, we have never had an appeal against any of our procurement decisions. I have built my reputation over the years as an honest and hard-working woman in the public service. This was until the JSC made the unfortunate, irregular, and procedural and irresponsible decision. I therefore welcome the probe, and I will personally work on restoring my reputation. All right, time now for KTN Sports. Today, I am Nicholas Mudimba. The team that represented Kenya in the just concluded 14th IAAF World Championships returned home today to a heroic welcome at the Jomo Kenyatta International Airport. Kenya bagged 12 medals, which includes five golds, four silvers, and three bronze medals, placing the team in the third position globally and fast in Africa. Edna Kiplagat started the Kenyan goal rush as she won the first Kenyan goal after one of the best outgoing Team Kenya now ponders as what tactics will embrace so as to beat more Farah on the track and something more than magic to bring the main smart and glory back to the country. The deputy president William Ruto was among those who were out to welcome the team. <laughs> Uh, 
Alex Tinao is uh, to work hard for the Olympics because that's the only race that I have not uh, done well. If the cup men are going to uh, to avail themselves to support us and at least to improve uh, the stadiums we are having and even to improve the training facilities, I, I know uh, there they will be great champions coming up. As for now, I'm just happy. My performance was great. I achieved my target. I set my target this year of 85 meters. I have achieved it. I did not get a medal, but I'm just okay. I'm just very happy because, you know, when you resolve something and you achieve it, it doesn't care. It doesn't matter what you, you achieve. The main important thing is if you uh, achieve your objectives. Uh, for me, I did my best. I could not win any medal, but uh, it was so close. And we want to commit ourselves as a country that going forward, we are going to make facilities more available in a better environment, uh, looking at lo changing our stadia, making sure that uh, these athletes have access to gym facilities because we believe that going forward they have been able to achieve this out of their own effort. All right, congratulations to the team. Moving on now, Gurmai hopes of clinching the Tusker Premier League this season are high as they are currently at the helm of the league with an eight-point difference lead. Gurmai, who have played 20 matches on the log, are on the summit of the league with 40 points and they hope to maintain the winning current streak. Ulysi Stars who managed to gain three points from the defending champions Tusker FC are on second position with eight points short from Kogalo, Sofapaka and Tika United share 32 points and on third and fourth position respectively with goal difference in favor of Superpaka. Moroni Youth starts the bottom five list with 23 points after playing 21 matches. Homeboys, who are the 15th position, are holding on with Karaturi Sports, who are this last position, with little hopes of surviving from the relegation. The confusion surrounding FC Lepers coach Luki Mile has now been settled by the club. The Belgian tactician is expected back in the country tomorrow and will prepare FC Lepers for the derby against league leaders Gurmahe next weekend. Elmia was absent for two weeks without permission from the club and through his chairman Alan Kasavuli, the club has been reassured of expected arrival of the coach in the country by tomorrow pending his flight from Belgium where had been airlifted by his embassy from ongoing political turmoil in Egypt. The club also wrote to KPL complaining of poor officiating of the match against City Stars yesterday. Yes. When you leave without giving us a notice that you left, of course, we have to uh, consider. As far as I knew, uh, Luke Emil had a, a funeral that to attend in Belgium. But uh, after talking to him at length this week, uh, he said actually because the issue of the flights where they were full, he took a connecting flight via Egypt to Nairobi. So because of the issue of the unrest which has been in uh, Egypt, Cairo, that is what made him that the flights were not leaving. So he was stuck there. But uh, the information is that the Belgium embassy uh, evacuated its nationals from Cairo back to Belgium. So that's why he went back, and now we are arranging for his flight to come back to Nairobi. All right, Nyanza's Kisumu Queens began the quest to winning the 2013 Copa Coca-Cola National Finals, totally in emphatic fashion by thrashing a hapless Managua Queens side 9-0 as the under-15 nationals began at the Hope Center in Kawangora here in Nairobi. The Lexi Queens confined the opponents in their own half from start to finish and were up 5-0 at halftime. Veronica Cage opened the floodgates with a 10th minute strike and doubled her team's lead in the 13th minute with a vicious shot from outside the area. Early in the day, Madari North outfit Otto Benica shocked Beijing girls with a 4-2 humbling in Nairobi Derby match. Beijing, who had not lost a match in the competition, took the lead in 36 seconds by Nancy Wall, but Otto leveled in the 10th minute through Shirul Angachi. Nairobi's GMJ Academy thrashed young Muslims from Northeastern 4-0, Musa Masika nating all the four goals and putting himself in the driving seat for the golden boot. and I just about to call you tonight. But before we leave, on the big question, we ask you if you're satisfied with the 11th Parliament performance that's owing to that uh, deal that they're just about to have.
have to raise their own salaries as and when they want. Here's how you put tonight. Indeed, 96% said no, they are not satisfied at all with the 11th parliament. And a, party, a, a paltry rather, 4% say yes, they are satisfied with the parliament. Let me just uh, sample one or two. One here says no, they are too greedy. They use Kenyans as donkeys to carry them on hungry stomachs. Shame on them. Another one here says, no, the MPs have so far done nothing for this nation. Some of them have never even appeared in their constituencies after the elections. Uh, last one here, no, it has not done anything. They, are just, they just demand for salary increases in payment, but no serious development. Choose Nguvu for undoubted strength. Thank you very much for the overwhelming uh, response and indeed for watching KTN Prime. My name is Betty Kale. Right, I'm James Smith. Do enjoy the rest of your evening. Sleep well.